Good afternoon, good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, now we I see 45 participants, but we received 106 or 70 registrations. So I, I think uh, we will, uh, many more, more people will uh, connect uh, while we are starting slowly. So uh, very well, welcome to uh, the new session of the Minamata Online Season 2. Uh, the Minamata Online is an online uh, uh, event uh, that the Minamata Convention Secretariat started last year, uh, and it has three streams. I think I will uh, explain uh, uh, what the Minamata Online is, uh, taking a bit of your time, uh, one, one minute. So Sharifu, can, if you can show the screen and share your screen. Um, so uh, this is a bit small, but you can you can you can see this at the uh, on a, on the website. Uh, we uh, published a schedule of the Minamata Online Season Two, and the yellow one is a science uh, Mercury Science stream. Uh, the, the gray one is about the implementation support and review, and the the, uh, the red one is uh, uh, preparation for the conference of parties. So uh, the the, uh, the Mercury Science stream uh, this for for this season is uh, convened uh, in full cooperation with ICMGP International Conference on Mercury as a Global Pollutant. So I uh, data I will invite. Uh, Joy Lerner, uh, the co-chair of the ICMGP 2022, uh, to say a few words. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, today, uh, th th this session is about global change and biochemical mercury cycling, which is one of the topics of the, the synthesis paper uh, to be presented at ICMGP, to which Joy will uh, speak to. So uh, I will just I'll make a bit of uh, logistic or housekeeping remarks. The next slide, please. Uh, so um, uh, the participants are automatically muted, uh, and, and uh, we may have uh, opportunities for for uh, oral questions. But basically, they, we will pick up the questions uh, in the Q and A box. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, please put uh, use the Q and A box and send it to all panelists because if you, if if you uh, uh, send send questions to only one one speaker uh the the moderators can 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 see it and he he will not be able, able to pick it up so please be make sure that the, your questions is sent to uh, the uh, uh uh the all the panelists and if you have any uh, uh, problem with, uh, with technical problems and so on. Then, then you can you can use the chat box and, and uh, send your message to uh, the uh, to, to the host. Next slide is my last one, and which is an agenda. And uh, we are at the opening, and then uh, the, we we will have three presentations that uh, Rob will will introduce, and then we will have a panel discussion. With this, I'm uh, handing over to Joy, the co-chair of ICMGP. Joy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aisaku, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to share with you the Mercury um, as a Global Pollutant, um, the ICGMP G, um, M M GP, uh, partnership with the Minamata Secretariat. And uh, welcome also to all participants here. I see we are now 59 attendees. And so um, I thought also to just share with everyone um, the recent developments in the um, in respect of the conference for 2022. As you aware, the conference would have happened actually this past week. Um, so South Africa, so your delegates would have been in South Africa this week had it not been for COVID. And so um, that was the date that we had planned the conference. So now then we, because of COVID, we've um, essentially agreed as the EXCO um, and this, the, the steering committee to have the conference um, in, on the 24th, of, 24th to 29th of July 2022. 
and it will be a virtual event. So this is more also just telling everyone about the conference um, event. And um, that is the website where it can be found. Next slide. Um, as because it is a virtual event and because it is it is no longer a Cape Town South Africa event, um, we've also as the Exco and the SSC agree reached agreement to include other um, past uh, uh, chairpersons of conferences and also the future a future um, chairperson of the conference to um, the Exco. And so the top two rows is essentially the um, existing EXCO, which is with the chairperson being um, Dr. Linwell Martin, and then myself, co-chairperson of the conference, and uh, Prof. Somerset and um, Dr. Walters, also co-chairpersons. And so the last, uh, the bottom uh, row really are the new people, um, the new members of the EXCO. And you will remember that um, Sandy Stephen, Dr. Alexander Stephen, she was the um, chairperson for the one in Halifax. And then um, Prof. Do Joseph uh, Pesina, he was the conference chairperson for Krakow, Poland. And then we've also um, ask, um, invited Dr. Um, Associate Prof. Asif Qureshi from India. Now, you will remember that India would have been the next one after, um, after South Africa, after Cape Town. And so we, um, I'll, I'll explain later why we've also invited him and it's good to have him on board. And then there's just one space still that we need to um, essentially uh, 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 still be, be confirmed. Then the next slide, uh, just to also draw attention, even though the conference is going to be virtual, um, we do have these call for, propose, for, for, for um, nominees in terms of the Lifetime Achievement Award and then also the Emerging Research Award. We felt it was very important to continue with this um, as part of the virtual conference. And then uh, the last part is really where we are today with ASAKU and with Minamata Online Season 2. We, we've partnered um, with the Minamata Secretariat and um, we have on the website um, listed above, we've called, made a call for mini proposals um, for workshops. And part of that uh, call was really to then also have um, uh, presenters then join in on the Minamata um, online season two. And so basically as the first part of the Minamata online season two, We've included uh, for the first four um, uh, uh, months, um, essentially running from July up to October, we've included the, um, the present uh, presenters who is currently running with the lead. They are the leads on the synthesis papers for the Mercury um, conference, the virtual conference. We've, we've, we've agreed to continue with the synthesis papers. And so they will be taking us through in July today and then um, August, September and October. And then in November, um, one of the um, leads of the workshops that we will offer at the virtual conference um, will then be in, in November and that will be um, Dr. Leslie Sloss. So um, please do join us every month um, and it's really great. Thank you once again, Aisako, for bringing us on board and we see this collaboration as something that is long lasting. Um, the partnership between the Minamata Secretariat and the um, IG, MG, uh, IM, ICMGP conference. And um, we see that as a long lasting relationship to basically bring science to the forefront, um, Mercury science to the forefront in line with the Minamata convention. Last slide. Um, and so, uh, just to indicate to those who are not aware, the conference uh, will now be taking place face to face after the virtual one in 2022. It will take place in uh, South Africa, in Cape Town, beautiful Cape Town, as you can see. So we would welcome you in July 2024. It is still work in progress. And so, um, as you will then can see that the 2024 conference is no longer taking place in India. And so, um, and we have Dr. Uh, uh, Professor Associate Prof. Kureshi then joining us to be on the on the steering committee and the, the exco for the 2022 one. 
But thank you, Aisaku, and all of the best to everybody today. Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you, Joey. So sorry I was muted. So um, then uh, we start the substantive part of uh, this session. And uh, Rob Mason uh, kindly accepted to be a moderator of this session. So I totally hand it over to, to Rob. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Osaku. Um, I'm very happy to introduce and moderate this um, discussion today um, to um, people I know very well. I've known both Jerome and Amina for a long time. Uh, some of you know that Amina was a PhD student with me a little while ago. Um, and so I just want to um, give some background. Jerome is currently the research director at TNRS in Toulouse in France. Um, I think I met him when he was a PhD student at the University of Florida. Um, so he got his PhD at Florida State University in 2003 in geology. Um, he actually has his MS, MS degree from Utrecht University, which he completed in 1998. After finishing his PhD, he went to um, the CNRS um, in Toulouse, and he was a Marie Curie Fellow from 2005 to 2006, and then um, joined the ICPMS unit there at CNRS, and he's been there ever since. He became the uh, research director in 2015. Um, looking at his CV, he has had 10 PhD students, three master's students, and a couple of postdocs. Um, he's published a large number of papers, um, 11 so far in 2021, I counted, and um, more than 20 last year. So incredibly productive. Um, uh, in terms of publications, and I'm sure you'll hear a lot about a lot of his research today. Um, the other uh, speaker, Amina, um, she uh, got a BS in, 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 um, at the University of Paris in 2004, and they did her MS there in, in geochemistry in 2006. She completed it. I met Amina while she was there doing her master's degree and that led to her coming to do her postdoc with me. She actually visited while I was still in Maryland the year before starting here and um, as a PhD student and she graduated in 2012. Um, after finishing here, she was a postdoc at Harvard School of Public Health um, and from 2012 to 2015 and then a research associate at the Harvard uh, School of Engineering and Applied Sciences um, until 2019, when she became um, an assistant. Prof 2019, she became an assistant professor at, at uh, in geosciences at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, uh, which is part of the University of California, San Diego. Um, so Amina has um, also had a large number of publications so far. Um, and uh, she currently is starting out, uh, has a couple of PhD students now in, as, in, um, at Scripps. And she also, of course, had me, I helped with the um, training of many students and PhD postdocs while she was at Harvard. So uh, with that introduction, I'll hand it over to them. They are making three presentations. Um, one will be a, an overview our global change in mercury biogeochemical cycling. Uh, there will be an overview presentation, and then uh, both Jerome and Amina have individual presentations that, that we'll make afterwards. At the end of the first presentation, we'll have a short period for questions and answers before we move on to the next presentation. Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Rob, for the introduction. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes. Good. Um, so thank you to the uh, to the organizers, Isaku and Joy, for inviting uh, Amina and myself to uh, to talk about global change and by geochemical mercury cycling. We're very pleased to be here today, and uh, we put together these uh, three kind of short talks on the topic. And we'll start with uh, with a bit of an introduction. Um, this is also a um, 
sort of a sneak preview to the uh, to the, the plenary lecture at the 2022 Cape Town ICMGP uh, on the same topic. So both the plenary lecture that will be done by Amina next year and uh, a synthesis paper that we uh, will be working on uh, starting this fall with with a team of colleagues that are experts in in a variety of merge recycling fields. Uh, the objectives for the plenary and the synthesis are basically to review the state of the science on merge recycling and global change, and to identify research and monitoring needs in light of the Minamata Convention Articles 19 and 22, and I'll, I'll get to the, the specifics of that. Um, so, like I say, we haven't done the job yet, so today is really a, a sneak preview of some of the things we uh, we would like to address in in the plenary and and the paper, and we welcome your uh, your your feedback and ideas on this in in the question and answer sessions. Uh, it's important to realize that global change is more than just climate change. Uh, global change includes changes in in land use, in land cover, urbanization, uh, population dynamics, the economy, energy consumption, you name it, in, in nutrient cycling. The water cycle, obviously, but also in ecology, in food web structure, and biodiversity. Um, mercury pollution is part of global change itself, and essentially, the Minamata Convention aims to uh, to curb global change because it will uh, start will try to limit mercury emissions and release to the environment. Uh, so, the, so the things you need to think about uh, that we would like to understand is how, and it's shown in this figure below how um, uh, biomass burning or natural wildfires that we hear much of uh, in recent years will affect mercury emissions, how uh, extreme climate events such as droughts or, uh, or flooding that we've also uh, witnessed in the past few weeks will affect mercury transfer from, from, uh, from let's say, soil ecosystems to aquatic ecosystems, et cetera. Um, a few words on, on these two articles that, uh, as scientists, we are concerned with. Uh, these articles address research development and monitoring of, uh, of mercury, and Article 22 is on the effectiveness evaluation. Again, more, more on monitoring. And there's, uh, in Article 19, there is an important focus on distinguishing anthropogenic and natural emissions and releases, and I'll, we'll talk about that today. In terms of the effectiveness evaluation, uh, there is definitely a need for, for expanded monitoring uh, uh, on the presence and, mo and movement of mercury, so fluxes and concentrations, but also trends, and we'll reflect on that. We organized the presentation with a number of very simple questions. You might be surprised. So, first of all, do we even understand the global and methyl mercury cycle? What are the uncertainties in its, in its various uh, in its various parts and fluxes. Do we understand what the natural background mercury and methyl mercury levels are on a planet that we have entirely uh, con contaminated? Uh, how fast will ecosystems recover following decreased emissions under convention, Minamata Convention policy? What is going to be the role of legacy mercury? And legacy mercury is all the mercury that we polluted and emitted in the past, but it still cycles at the surface of the earth. Okay, and global change, but also Obviously, what's the role of climate change in uh, in mercury cycling? So, do we have uh, the knowledge and the models to to simulate and to understand global change and mercury uh, and mercury emission release effects? When you see, when you have a trend, is that trend related either to global change or is it related to your uh, mercury emission policy? Can you say your policy is effective or is it related to global change? Uh, many of you will know this figure. This is uh, the global mercury budget from the UNEP 2018 global mercury assessment. This figure shows fluxes from geogenic sources, half a gigaton per year from volcanoes, for example, anthropogenic sources to the atmosphere, two and a half gigatons. Uh, once in the atmosphere, we basically say that Emissions equal deposition, so you get a deposition to land and to water, these gray fluxes in the middle. But once mercury has been deposited, it's remitted again. And then it becomes that's where it becomes legacy mercury. So there's a large marine re-emission flux and also a large, uh, a smaller but but still significant terrestrial re-emission flux. 
Uh, this, this budget figure is literally the work of, of decades of military scientists, generations of military scientists that have uh, made measurements and, uh, and, and estimations to, to, to piece this together. So how well do we really know many of these fluxes? What's the remaining uncertainty? And to give you a few examples, let's look at the river flux from land to ocean. 0.3 gigagram uh, per year in, in the UNEP budget from 2018. There is a new paper, a very nice paper on, on the global river budget uh, impressed with nature geoscience. And it bumps up to one gigagram per year. That's three times more. That's a 300% uncertainty on the UNEP figure. Uh, similarly, for volcanic budget, which has always been difficult to estimate, it's at 0.5 gigagram per year in the UNEP budget. But more recent data that now use uh, satellite observations on volcanic SO2 fluxes that are used to, to upscale military fluxes indicate something smaller, 0.2 gigagram per year. And that's important because when you go from 0.5 natural to 2.5 gigagrams anthropogenic, that's a factor five difference. But if natural emissions are smaller, that means that we are polluting more than we think we are. Okay. So many other aspects have uncertainties. It's, it's always been difficult to monitor deposition over the oceans. You can only do this on islands. Uh, submarine volcanic emissions, not very well known, could be a factor of 10 different. Okay, so I, it's important to, to, to understand that this, this is the best we have done so far, but there is remaining uncertainty that we will need to understand if we want to understand global change effects. Let's look at another uh, angle uh, at, at the complexity of the global mercury cycle by looking at the mechanisms and the reactions. This is a, a figure from Cés Lopez, a recent paper on atmospheric mercury reactions, oxidation, reduction. Mercury zero is the form we emit, but it goes through a whole myriad of oxidation reactions by ozone, by halogens, and it's then photolyzed back to mercury zero. So some of these oxidized forms end up in clouds and on particles and you'll find them in rainfall. But overall, this is, uh, this is still fairly complex, and we've come a long way in understanding these, uh, these complex reactions. Similar things happen in the ocean. The inorganic mercury forms deposit to the oceans, mercury two, mercury zero, that's a gas. Oxidation reduction goes on. There's methylation, most likely by microbes, uh, most likely and most strongly in the oxygen minimum zone, but possibly throughout the water column. There's a second form, dimethylmercury, that we don't understand very well how it is produced and at, at what rates. And so there's progress here to be made as well. And then if you look at, at the lower trophic food web, a variety of planktonic species, zooplankton species, this is the first very important step of mercury uh, uh, bioaccumulation, a factor of 10,000 to 100,000 from dissolved levels to, uh, to the food web. If you then go to the higher trophic uh, food web, again, very complex interactions. This is a figure for the Arctic. And then we have humans, right? Uh, neurotoxic endpoints, heart disease in adults, uh, complicated interactions with selenium. So overall, uh, this is a very nonlinear system, right? If we want to understand how global change or environmental policy uh, cascades into exposure effects, we, we need to understand what we're, uh, what we're talking about. Uh, so let's take a look at that second question, uh, natural background of mercury levels. These are also figures from the, the UNEP GMA. Uh, these are mercury fluxes on Y against time, from 2000 back to 1800 in uh, short sediment archives. These are sediment pores, dated, analyzed for mercury. And you'll generally uh, see about a factor of three, four, five enrichment in, uh, in, in mercury deposition since about the 1850s. And this is mostly data from the Northern Hemisphere. And this number, many people take this for granted. This is, this is what we understand. We've polluted the surface of our planet by a factor of 4.5. Thing is, if you if you take a look at much longer radiocarbon dated sediment, but also peat archives, you get a very different picture. This is work from uh, one of my PhD students, Shushan Li. Uh, she reviewed uh, all the available data on the long cores, and what she finds in, in northern hemisphere peat and sediment cores, if you look at it, at enrichment since not 1800 but since 1450, you will find about 16 times enrichment. Uh, since these uh, 
on these longer time scales, and that goes all the way back into the Holocene. If you do the same exercise in the Southern Hemisphere, you get a different picture. It's been less polluted, less emissions, less release. There's only a factor of four overall since, uh, since 1450. So that's what I'm saying. Do we really understand what the natural background is, right? So we've translated and worked on uh, estimating what that represents for the atmosphere, because this is atmospheric deposition. But what about atmospheric levels? So it's very well possible that the Southern Hemisphere actually has a higher natural background in Mercury Zero. And the way we got to that was by looking at these uh, pre-1450 AD layers in the peat cores. If you look at atmospheric mercury deposition and the units here on Y are micrograms per square meter per year, you'll actually find that uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, these deposition rates, the natural rates are higher than in the Northern Hemisphere by about a factor of two. And uh, of course we need more data on this. It's only the beginning, but it's very well possible that the two hemispheres, that of course the Southern Hemisphere is it's a lot of ocean, Rob will know this. And the Northern Hemisphere is much more terrestrial interaction in the Mercury cycle, okay? Um, let's move from these inorganic Mercury uh, data to, uh, to methylmercury trends. So again, here a figure of what atmospheric Mercury zero may have looked like over the 20th century. There's a lot of real measurements in recent times. There's some EMAP data back to the 70s. Then there's reconstructions from uh, snow cores and from peat. Uh, that suggests that levels were twice higher in the 70s and 80s and that they already dropped by a factor of two. And that's that's an interesting scenario, right, for what we're thinking about today. Minimata convention decreases in emissions. Are we going to be able to monitor this? If you look at mercury emission inventories, so these are bottom-up estimates of how much we have emitted over time, so also back to 1850. I want you to focus on what happened since the 70s. These emission inventories, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, also show a factor of nearly two decrease in emissions that agree then with the archives. This big uh, potato here in, in the 19th century is very controversial. That's a gold rush uh, emission peak. It's not really sure whether that really uh, led to a, a very strong global emissions. So let's now go to, um, to biota, specific tuna levels. Uh, back to the 70s, this is a study by Dravnik et al. from 2015. It's not a lot of data, but it's very puzzling. The black, red, and green data are the tuna data in different uh, time periods. Basically, not much of a change since the 70s and a more recent increase. So this is very contradictory with what we know from the inventories and from archives. And it's something we need to understand. Again, the Dravnik study, it's not a lot of data. and. Uh, in general, there is a lack of historical biomonitor data back into the, the, those decades where we think mercury levels were very high. And that this, this all justifies, well, more work on the historical data, but definitely more work in the next few decades to, to monitor better. Um, of course, the last two decades, there's more data, but that's, uh, that's not what we're looking at here. There's another way to look at uh, at ecosystem recovery and the role of legacy mercury, and it's by using models. And a very good example is, is a simple box model that was uh, developed in Elsie Sunderland's group at Harvard. I think Rob was involved in this early on as well. Um, simple in the sense that there's only seven boxes here in this scheme. The atmosphere, three soil boxes where mercury cycles fast, vegetation, more slowly and, and more uh, even more slowly, sort of in the deep soil horizons. There's also three ocean boxes, surface, subsurface, and, and deep ocean. And anything you emit at the surface ultimately, ultimately ends up in, uh, in marine sediments, coastal sediments and deep ocean sediments. So the way these box models work is that fluxes between the boxes are uh, proportional to the mass of mercury in the box. And so this, this diagram shows you uh, these constants that we call first order transfer constants, those stay constant. But as you increase the mass, for example, in the atmosphere, you increase the flux to the ocean and to, uh, to soils. So these models are very useful to, to simulate how a mercury emission pulse uh, propagates from the atmosphere into the ocean, into soil compartments. And when you stop that pulse, you can look at how those reservoirs will recover, right? So this figure summarizes um, such a pulse to the atmosphere. Here you have uh, 
time in years on X, and you have the fraction of mercury initially released to the atmosphere. So one means 100% to the atmosphere. You can see that immediately it shows up in light green in vegetation and in the surface ocean. And then as time goes by, after one year, it shows up in the subsurface ocean. After 50 to 200 years, 500 years, shows up in the deep ocean. Same for coastal sediments, deep sediments. In the soil system, it takes time and it lingers a long time. It lingers for hundreds of years in the soil system before it's, it's eventually running off significantly uh, by rivers to the coastal ocean. So this box model gives you a good idea of the time scales involved in, in recovery. Uh, this is what happens when you stop the pulse. These are results from that model. If in 2015 you have 100%, then you can see that the atmosphere rapidly recovers. After only 10 years, you're down to 60%. In the surface ocean, it's a bit slower already. After, uh, after about 50 years, you no, 30 years, you have dropped 20%. And to go to 50%, even in the surface ocean, it takes 100 years, right? And the deep ocean will actually continue to increase, even though uh, we would have stopped emitting. Um, so that's a simple box model. What can we do today with uh, very uh, sophisticated 3D mercury cycling models? Actually, a few, uh, a few months ago, really a, a landmark paper came out by Yan Shuzang uh, and co-workers in Nature Communications. Uh, this is the first time that an Earth system mercury model was coupled to uh, a mercury exposure model. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll show you how did this works. So it, it started off this kind of modeling three decades ago with numerical models in the atmosphere, four by five degrees latitude, where you can uh, you have meteorology, you simulate where the mercury emissions go. Today, those are coupled to 3D ocean models. Those models include uh, an ecosystem, up to 80 species of plankton. And they are, in, in this study, they are now uh, driven with uh, climate models, IPCC scenarios, meteorological data, ocean physics data. And so that Earth system model is then in the lower scheme coupled to a mercury exposure model that takes into account statistics on, on food, methylmercury in food, food intake, population projections, uh, different disease patterns in different countries, to translate exposure into uh, IQ loss, into fatal heart attacks in adults, and that eventually translates into economic loss. Um, results for this model are, are shown here from the paper. Uh, these are per year uh, decrements in IQ, for example, in the upper left, uh, figure where you will recognize that countries that rely on seafood, including uh, Greenland, Scandinavia, Southeast Asia, Japan, have uh, a stronger IQ decrement than countries that where fish is less consumed. Heart attacks relate heavily to uh, other health factors. Uh, so Russia, India, and China are impacted here. Uh, economic losses run into the billions of dollars per year. And uh, in this final lower figure, it all adds up to uh, to something on the order of 200 billion US dollars per year in, in the cost of mercury cycling, uh, mercury emissions. Uh, some more figures from that model. In the lower left-hand figure, they simulated between 2010 and 2015, how different uh, environmental policy scenarios may propagate through this, uh, this cycling and exposure model. So you have three colors in black, basically a flatline current practice, current total mercury emissions stay the same. Then you have a green curve for maximal feasible reduction and uh, red curves business as usual. And you can see again in these uh, 3D models that atmospheric deposition responds relatively quickly. The soils do not respond quickly. But in the ocean, the responses are also faring quickly, and that brings hope that, uh, that policy will limit mercury emission and exposure. Okay, so I'm, I'm arriving at the end. Uh, yeah, so our challenge is to, to understand all of these complex interactions. If I fall back onto the questions we asked at the start, then, uh, then sort of preliminary answers might be something like, do we understand global mercury cycling? Yes, there are uncertainties. We know the background levels, yes, but there is debate. Uh, work remains to be done. How fast will ecosystems recover? So this range of models does show that probably marine surface ocean 
ecosystems might recover rapidly, terrestrial, definitely slowly, and coastal, who knows, intermediate. Uh, can, uh, can these type of models and, and, and the knowledge we have today and that we will gather help us, um, well, help simulate and understand the differences between global change effects and emission uh, release effects? The answer is likely, but uh, we definitely have science gaps to fill. So uh, we'll be working is, on this over the year, and we invite you to uh, to, to listen uh, to the plenary lecture next year. And so in, I think it's time for questions, and then we'll do two more specific talks on, on case studies. Back to Rob. Thanks very much. That was a great introduction. Um, please type any questions you have in the question and answer box. Um, I don't see any there right now. Um, I did have a question, uh, if, so I'll start off with that if I can. So, Jerome, you said that the background in the Southern Hemisphere um, is, are you predicting it? Well, the, the paper predicted it was higher in the Southern Hemisphere than in the Northern Hemisphere. And it, is this related to emissions of mercury from the ocean and, the, and related to that differences in re-emission from oceans versus terrestrial? Yeah, that's a great question, and that is uh, that is one of the two working hypotheses. And uh, the 3D cycling models they have already shown that mercury emissions from the southern ocean and the southern hemisphere are more important than in the northern hemisphere, largely because uh, it's more windy in uh, in southern ocean than in northern hemisphere oceans, and also because there is simply more ocean in in the southern hemisphere. Another hypothesis that we will be looking at is the idea that um, uh, the, um, the plant mercury pump is less present in the Southern Hemisphere. So it's the idea that plants are actually uh, assimilating mercury zero from the atmosphere along with carbon, along with CO2. And because in the Southern Hemisphere, you have relatively little uh, continents that, that effect is smaller than in the Northern Hemisphere. <clears throat> um, uh, any other questions? Uh, There's a question in the chat. In the chat. Yeah, there are a couple so, questions actually. Yeah, if I keep up my slides, I cannot see the chat, so I will let you ask the question, Rob. So um, there was a there was a comment about the inclusion um, of uh, an image of a mouse with a dental amalgam. Uh, the role of dental amalgams is neglected. Um, so that was that's a, a good comment. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting comment. I mean, you you have to understand that this very complicated coupled cycling exposure model it's it's the first it's unique it's the first step we're going to see decades of evolutions of these models and they will likely include uh, other exposure pathways in the future yeah and then there was a question about uh uh, uh in the zhang paper and the model papers uh, and i guess the question relates to whether coastal areas are affected differently from you know the more continental part of uh, surely there would be different exposures between coastal levels and coastal environments and more interior environments. Uh, that doesn't really, maybe it's just the scale of the maps and the model that doesn't really show up. Yeah, that's also a good question. Um, you know, in coastal ecosystem systems, um, mercury and methylmercury are derived both from continental inputs and from marine currents. So you have, uh, you have, you have a mix. And we've seen that the soil compartments globally are fairly slowly to respond to emission policy. So for coastal ecosystems, I would expect sort of a, an intermediate scenario where uh, the response to policy, so the, the lowering of methylmercury levels is going to be slower than in the open ocean, uh, but faster than in freshwater environments. 
Great. I think uh, given um, our timing, maybe we could move on to the next presentation and we'll come back with more questions at the end. Hi everyone, thank you for having us here today. Um, as you've guessed, I will be talking about trends in fish uh, more specifically as an example of some of the possible impacts of uh, global change um, on, on fish trends. And uh, I think Yaron did a pretty good job setting up this stage, so I don't need to go into the details, but we can also talk a little bit about the uncertainty. Uh, I'd like to apologize. Kind of early for me. I'm usually like not a morning person, so I may be a little <laughs> unclear, but hopefully it'll still it'll still be not too painful. If I can go to the next slide. <laughs> so um mercury has been used and released by humans for thousands of years. Um and in part that's uh, built into this uh legacy mercury that uh, Yaron has talked about. Uh, it, it is a fascinating element in that sense that it has all these physical and chemical properties that humans have found uh, really interesting and useful for a long time, which is why it is uh, an environmental issue that it is today. Uh, it's been used, um, so the, the, the mineral uh, mercury cinnabar is this really nice and bright red pigment that has been used um, in, as you can see here, pottery. Um, it's been it's had it was believed to have uh, medicinal properties and was used to treat all kinds of treat all kinds of diseases including um you know syphilis of course um uh, amalgamation of gold so uh, really a uh, wide usage of uh, mercury and artisanal gold mining um and of course um many industrial since the industrial area may, many industrial uses that you, um, you may see every day around you, or actually maybe not necessarily connected to the, the mercury cycle that we're talking about, but it is it is present. You've, you've seen those CFL light bulbs that say a little sticker on them. Most of those UV lights have a little sticker on them that says there's mercury in them. And so we, we are using mercury and we are releasing mercury as a consequence. Um, and I think this goes back to one of the question in the chat, which mercury species uh, is the, worse for the environment, I think someone asked. Uh, so there are several species of mercury, as, as uh, Yvonne has mentioned. Uh, there's the or inorganic species of mercury. Um, and these are, uh, in terms of uh, neurotoxicity, they're not as, as, as it's not, a, they're not as bad because they have a relatively low absorption rate in the organism. So if you, for example, ingest some inorganic mercury, most of it is going to be processed by your metabolism and get, get rid of. Um, on the other hand, you have uh, things like methylmercury, which is the organomercury uh, species, and this one has a really high absorption rate. It, it, you know, once you ingest it, a big chunk of it stays it in in your body, accumulates in the brain, where it can create all kinds of problems about interacting with proteins, whose role it is in enzyme, whose role it is to kind of maintain the health of your nervous system, and. Um, and so as a result, uh, it's particularly damaging to um, individuals and things that have a central nervous system. Uh, everything that does not have it obviously is fine. Uh, well, not obviously, but may be fine, I suppose. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, you, some of you may have heard of uh, Mad Hatters and that's, uh, because people were using uh, mercury in the felting industry to make uh, felt that is used in hats. And uh, that was a fairly common practice in, in, in several areas, including where I grew up as a, as a PhD student uh, right outside uh, Connecticut, uh, where they were using uh, mercury for in the felting industry. And uh, uh, they, the vapor that are released have created health issues for the workers in those plants. So, as I've said, uh, we have um, a lot of uh, both historical usages, but as well as uh, really diverse industrial usages more recently. Uh, we know that emissions from coal burning, uh, it releases mercury into the environment. We also know that uh, mercury is a neurotoxin and um, 
uh, a lot of the exposure today, uh, unless you work, uh, you know, uh, you've worked in a felt in a factory, uh, a lot of the, the um, exposure to mercury is through consumption of fish. Um, but what we do not know is uh, where are the trends uh, going so that mercury that has been released over time that is interacting with all those different processes in the environment, uh, how does it then, what, how much of it ends up in the fish and uh, where is that going as our environment is changing and as our emissions are changing? This is particularly important and this has been driving some of my uh, most recent work uh, for population that are at greater risk of exposure. Uh, these population tend to consume uh, large quantities of uh, predatory fish. Uh, they rely on them for um, both uh, nutrition, but also social well-being and cultural well-being. And so it is important to make sure that the levels of uh, neurotoxic species, such as mercury, but also many others, remain at levels that allow people to enjoy uh, traditional foods. Uh, unfortunately, it's not uh, just restricted to, um, a, it's, it's not just something that is a localized issue. This is also a global issue where uh, mercury exposure comes from all over the place. So it makes it very difficult to track uh, the sources of mercury to people's food because the food industry itself is very global. Um, so, um, for example, this is a pie chart from Elsie Sunderland's paper from 2018 looking at a U.S. population exposure during this period, uh, 2010 to 2012, um, where is the methylmercury coming from uh, in, in the diet in general? As you can see, uh, we have the North Pacific, Equatorial South Pacific that pr provide most of the mercury exposure, but also spread around from other so uh, ocean sources. And this makes things difficult because if we do want to reduce uh, exposure, we do have to tackle this as a global issue, which is good because that's what it's being is. Well, it's it's good that it's being done at the global level because this is a global issue. Uh, this is an example of uh, the methylmercury intake in the U.S. population. And as you can see here, uh, tuna is leading uh, the way. Uh, and that's because it's uh, re readily available. People like to consume tuna. You can see pictures of canned tuna, but it also has uh, elevated mercury level. Um, uh, as a contrast, you have shrimp, which is number two here. Shrimp has relatively low levels of mercury. Uh, methylmercury, but uh, people uh, consume a really large amount of shrimp, and so that ends up uh, being a pretty substantial source of methylmercury intake. Uh, and uh, this, I guess, the, the, the shrimp consumption has been increasing quite a bit with um, with just the availability of it. Where it used to be a pretty niche uh, luxury item, but now you can find it everywhere. So that's increased the intake of shrimp. Okay, let's get back a little bit into some of the things that you will mention, but zoomed in into the, the bioaccumulation, the biomagnification. So this is uh, just a simple um, graphic of, of the, the, the bioaccumulation of methylmercury. So we know that inorganic mercury gets transformed into methylmercury in the water column, as well as uh, in the sediment. Uh, these processes are controlled by all kinds of different uh, things such as organic matter content, nutrient availability, uh, et cetera. Uh, but of course, the, the microbes that are involved in these processes uh, are impacting the rate of production. And then on the other side, you have once this methylmercury is produced, um, what is driving the uptake of methylmercury? So you have, uh, again, organic matter content of the water as well as other um, elements, compounds in the water that may facilitate the uptake or prevent the uptake. And of course, uh, something that has had slightly less um, uh, questions uh, answered and a lot more uncertainty is, okay, how, once the, it enters this phytoplankton, what happens to the methylmercury? Do we understand the steps that are involved in the biomagnification and what are the different environmental impacts that may affect the biomagnification? Why do we have, um, you know, greater biomagnification in some areas than others? How do environmental changes 
uh, such as changes in seawater temperature, uh, changes in productivity, all these things you're hearing about uh, in terms of environmental change and climate change that are occurring, um, as well as anthropogenic pressures on those different species impacting the biomagnification process. And so these are questions that um, we've had for a, a while and we were trying to figure out what's the best way of doing it. Here are the, the issues that we're running into. Uh, you could do uh, incubation experiments in, in, in a beaker or like a small system and then look at, for example, uptake of methylmercury into different uh, phytoplankton sizes and then make conclusions for that. You can maybe have a couple trophic levels or maybe even three trophic levels to look at how mercury propagates across those little uh, mini food webs. Uh, but what we, we cannot really do is go all the way to the high trophic level fish um, that live for 30, 40 years, uh, interact in complex manners with, with the environment, but also other species. Um, and uh, the other uh, issue that is difficult is if you're, for example, doing a uh, monitoring of, of, of trends over time is that a lot of the environmental changes that are happening are already baked in into the observed trends that you have. And so it's very difficult to deconvolute why are things changing and, for example, you know, a fish a cod concentrations, are they changing because of mercury deposition or emission or are they changing due to uh, food web structures or other things? And so it was, it was, um, why we decided to create this uh, model to be able to um, at least test within this virtual aquarium uh, how do food webs potentially respond to those environmental changes they're all occurring at the same time and once we build the model we can force it with environmental changes that like i said happen at the same time we can enforce it with changing seawater methylmercury concentrations. We can force it with changing uh, seawater temperature. We can force it with uh, the inputs in organic matter and the type of organic matter that we put in. Uh, for example, you can look at, well, you know, you could have a lot of, of organic matter production because you have a lot of phytoplankton. Now productivity is increasing because, you know, um, the temperature is higher. Uh, or nutrient inputs has increased. Or we can uh, look at the input of terrestrial because you have a lot more rain in some areas that are washing down a lot of nutrients into the ecosystem, washing down in a lot of terrestrial organic matter. So the idea was to, to create this virtual model where we can play around with some of those parameters and look at how the food web responds across uh, multiple trophic levels. And so the the model needs to be mechanistic where in a sense we try to put in our best understanding of how do uh, things grow in the water so like how does phytoplankton grow or copepods grow and who do they eat uh, so the you know for example as you know um, a predator will have a preferred you know panel of choices of, of food that it likes to eat among like three different species and so in this model, we uh, uh, randomly assign, uh, you know, praise that some predator may like to eat and put in some encounters. So, for example, let's say this grill has three different types of copepods that it likes to eat. Uh, it will randomly run into some of them and eat uh, to satisfy its energetic needs. Um, and in the process of satisfying its energetic needs, it ends up also accumulating mercury. Uh, the model is sensitive to things like, uh, you know, a dissolved organic matter concentration, as well as uh, chlorophyll A changes of uh, sizes of, of um, phytoplankton. And, um, and so the first step was to make sure that at least in the system where we were working with it, which is was the, the Gulf of Maine uh, area. And the reason we picked that area was because there was a lot of data. And as uh, Yaron has mentioned, there's not a lot of a long, like long-term monitoring data of of the, the species uh, of the mercury concentrations, but also uh, the dietary uh, uh, preferences of those different animals and how those have changed. And the the Gulf of Maine region has actually you know has been uh, tracking a lot of these things for a long time, which has made it really really useful for us to be able to uh, parameterize the model, 
um, and then and then evaluated it uh, to the best uh, to our capabilities. And so this is uh, phytoplankton uh, concentrations uh, modeled versus measured uh, across a range of sizes. We also looked at you know zooplankton uh, concentrations in the model compared to um, data that was available. Some of the differences, especially the way we measure uh, for the mercury work because of the needs in terms of like collecting enough material uh, is a difficulty of doing species specific collection of those smaller, uh, lower trophic levels. And, and so the species specific is really important because it does, uh, it, it does influence what those different species, the predators eat. And so it will influence the mercury level. And so a lot of the measurements that I've done in the past, like as you can see those dots here, were actually done by size. So people would like pick a size fraction and um, um, they would pick a size fraction and then measure mercury in that size fraction. So you could potentially have multiple trophic level mixed in into a single size fraction, depending on the region. So a lot of uncertainty there in, in that type of data. So more species specific work will be, uh, will be is really needed. And we, we could test some of my hypothesis. We wanted to see whether um, as a system becomes more eutrophic, uh, going from oligotrophic, so like low nutrient, low pro uh, productivity to high nutrient, high productivity, whether we will see a response in the in the food webs in terms of uh, mercury levels, and what we're seeing is, for example, as you go from this low productivity to high productivity uh, system uh, for phytoplankton, we see a decline, which was predicted and have seen in in experimental work, a decline in methylmercury concentrations. However, it, using our model, you could see that once you go to the higher trophic level we see this flattening on the curve. So it looks like eutrophication in the system does not propagate to those higher trophic level, even though it substantially impacts uh, phytoplankton concentrations. Uh, we expanded the, the food web to model to, to uh, higher trophic level. And this kind of shows the, 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 inter the interactions that we put into the model based on uh, the stomach content of the different species that we were working in. In, and I guess not just fish, we also had some um, crabs and lobsters and et cetera. Um, so I, I wanted to make some a few points about some of the, the, the importance of energetics uh, in, in terms of accumulating mercury. So a lot of discussion in the past has been really focused on the trophic level of the different species. And um, oh, in, in, is, the energetics of the different species are actually driving a lot of the, the mercury accumulation. And the reason for that is because depending on the energetic needs of different species, they will accumulate more or less uh, mercury, uh, regardless of the trophic position they're, they're in. And the reasons for that is, is I like to use this Michael Phelps analogy, is that um, he consumes about 10,000 calories, 12,000 calories at the height of his, of his Olympic career. And he's not, so that's about like six times larger than a, you know, a regular human like myself, who about consumes about 2000 and, and less. Uh, yet he's not six times bigger than I am. At least I don't think so. So his, his energetic demand is much higher. So he's gonna consume, if we both ate sardines, his exposure to mercury would be substantially higher than mine just because he's consuming and burning so many calories and but he's accumulating all that mercury through the consumption of those 10,000 calories. So if you think about that, uh, that explains why some species, uh, for example, uh, this is an example here, bluefin tuna, really high energetic needs. Um, if you model it through regular bioenergetics uh, model, you get this flat line. We can't really replicate the mercury levels that we see. However, if you, uh, you know, integrate the fact that they're burning all these ex and additional uh, calories, uh, you can uh, replicate the, the methylmercury concentration in, in tuna. Um, similarly, uh, uh, all the characteristic of those different species, for example, uh, depending on their gape size, how big of a fish can they swallow? Can they knock their prey down? Can they hold it while they take bites? Is going to impact uh, how easily and how much methylmercury they're accumulating. So it's not just a matter of trophic position, it's trophic position. And do you have any additional characteristic uh, specific to you as a predator that will uh, make you uh, be exposed to more methylmercury? So there's um, uh, a lot of little little things that, uh, you know, add to the complexity of the, the cycle. And so 
overall, uh, we did a pretty good job at um, modeling methylmercury in, in different trophic levels. And once we had a model that was working, it is mecha mechanistic. So it's like uh, independent of, uh, you know, statistical relationship that are usually found uh, by just measuring it. Uh, we could, uh, in the, our virtual aquarium, move around the, the, the different parameters and then see how things respond. So this is an example of cod methylmercury concentration uh, under a base scenario. So this was a, a 2000 scenario with the, the food that the cod was consuming in 2000. And then we uh, increase the temperature of our in our model to look at how would the cod methylmercury concentration will change. And we see that uh, by adding, warming the waters by one degree, changing nothing else, the methylmercury in the environment levels are the same, you increase the methylmercury concentration in the cod. And by changing the diet of the cod based on stomach contents from what it was in 2000 to uh, a 70s type diet, you can see that the 70s diet of that cod was lower than uh, based on what they were eating in 2000. This is interesting because if you do the same thing with a fish that is also living in the same environment, more or less, uh, you know, um, exposed to the same changes in, in mercury levels, if you a model in space scenario and then changes that to the 70s, so you can see that the 70s diet for dogfish was actually higher than what we had for cod. And the reasons for that is because in the 70s, there was a crash in herring. And so uh, the species, despite living in the same ecosystem, have chosen a different alternative prey. And depending on the prey that they're going to choose, and so the crash was due to overfishing of herring, depending on the prey that a species chooses, its mercury levels are going to be either increasing and de or decreasing. And so this is really interesting because that does add a level of complexity in terms of you know, uh, we, we may see declining methylmercury emissions and deposition and production of methylmercury in the in the water column, but the changes in the ecosystem and the food web structure itself may, you know, up or down uh, the levels in the in those uh, in some species. So we did something similar with with the bluefin tuna and we wanted to see how over time changing the temperature we're wondering since they had this they did this, these really high bioenergetic needs and a sensitivity to see what a temperature. We wanted to see if we forced the the, the bluefin tuna concentration with different temperature as well as methylmercury concentration. What kind of trends we're going to see uh, over time in the past, but also can we project in the future? And so, what we were uh, what we see is that there is a variability in in the the methylmercury levels in the model bluefin tuna. Uh, just based on changing seawater temperature, um, and that the as you can see in our projected area uh, section here, where we see uh, methylmercury levels re relatively flat due to global control, we can see an increase in methylmercury levels just driven by changes in the ecosystem and not ch just changes of mer mercury. And so this is, I think, an important message that uh, uh, we thought need to get out there that those changes in, 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 in the ecosystem may kind of either overshadow some of the, of the progress that is made in terms of reduction. Although, you know, the reality is that had we not reduced the emissions, it would have been a bigger problem. So we need, if anything, we need more drastic reduction, uh, but we also need to make sure that we're cognizant of these ad additional changes that are happening and not feel disappointed that the efforts are not working where they are. We just may not see them because they're overshadowed by all these environmental uh, changes. And on this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take some questions. I hope I didn't run over too much my time here. I forgot to start my, my watch. <laughs> all right, thanks very much, Amina. That was really great. Um, I think we do have time for um, any questions. Uh, if someone would put a question into the chat box, um, I don't see anything there at the moment. Um, I was just going to ask quickly, I mean, you talk about temperature effects. Um, and one of the big things is migration. I know, for example, in Long Island Sound, we, we're seeing fish species now that we didn't used to have. and the lobsters have gone north and that sort of thing. So what is the impact of, of fish changes and fish distributions on, on exposure? 
Yeah, so this is a great question, and I would say that this is probably like the next step. Uh, and I've I've played around with it a little bit. Uh, I haven't gotten around to to actually go to the next step. Is what happens when you start adding? Because you could like within the model, you could start adding different fish species and reshuffle the food web structure and then see how that may impact the mercury level. I suspect that some of the dynamics are kind of the same as what we we're seeing in the past, right? Because we have we have the changes and you know you remove the fish. So I think it will depend on which one you add, which one do you remove, how do they um, process mercury, what do they eat? Uh, so like a main major major limiting um, factor in being able to doing this work is knowing the bioenergetics of the different species. And so we have so the way those are done. Usually people would take them and then they will plop them in a chamber where they can control the oxygen rate. Uh, consumption and metabolism of those fish. You can only do this with species that we can actually grow in an aquarium. Uh, it's really difficult for the ones that are, are not. So there's been a lot of progress in terms of like trackers that are they're putting on some of those, the, uh, the, you know, those larger species that we can't really grow in, in, the, in the lab. Although even if we did grow them, we are impacting the bioenergetics, right? They're not migrating anymore. They're not behaving the way. So this is like a major, major area of uncertainty. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, I think in the um, because of time, we should move on to the third presentation right now. Um, you ready for that, Gerard? Yes. Let me share my screen again. And can everybody see this? Is this okay? Can you see the screen? Yes, we do. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, so we wanted to take you uh, north and take a look at what's happening uh, in, in, the, in the Arctic terrestrial environment. Uh, so the talk is called uh, Permafrost Mercury Feedback, which is kind of borrowed from the permafrost carbon feedback and whether that will lead to regional or global consequences. So going to take a little bit of time to thank a number of collaborators uh, with whom I work in, in the Arctic. Uh, Russian scientists Nikita and Oleg, uh, but also um, people in many people in France or in, in Scandinavia, Lars Eric Heimberger, uh, Martin Jiskra, Daniel Ogrist in the US, and many, many others who've participated in field work. And uh, a quick thanks to the funders as well in France and Europe. Uh, a lot of work uh, funded by the Polar Institutes. So let's go back to the 1990s uh, when it was realized that Arctic biota had extremely high mercury levels and was impacting uh, Arctic indigenous populations. And questions asked uh, early on, of course, were how does mercury get to the Arctic? Because there are not that many local point sources. And this uh, figure by McDonald et al. 2005 nicely illustrates uh, the three main path pathways to consider. So obviously the atmosphere. But not only, not only because the Arctic Ocean is a small basin, it's surrounded by continents, and it's known that uh, there is rather important river runoff, both from North America, but uh, especially from Siberia, which uh, generates 80% of, of runoff into the Arctic Ocean. And then you also have ocean currents. The Atlantic Ocean is basically feeding the, the Arctic Basin, and then there's a return flow to the Atlantic Ocean that I will talk about later. Uh, so, in the 1990s, work by Bill Schroeder and, and Sandy Steffen uh, discovered atmospheric mercury depletion events. This is very uh, easy to see in a time series of atmospheric mercury zero, here from 1995 all the way to 2008. So, every, uh, every spring when the sun rises in the Arctic, you get uh, photochemistry with halogens oxidizing mercury, not only mercury, also ozone. Uh, oxidizing it in that mercury deposit. So you get a dip, a depletion in atmospheric mercury. In the lower figure, you can see oxidized mercury forms on aerosols that are, are complementary, so there's mass balance. And then this happens every, every spring, and what you also see is a rebound of mercury levels in the summer, and those are potentially re-emissions from snow. That's what was uh, thought early on. And uh, in the thousands that was uh, intensively studied, these, uh, these re-emissions after the AMDE events. 
studies here on the left by uh, Aurélien Domergue in France that found 99% of re-emission uh, after an event. And on, on the right, uh, sort of a summary figure from the 2011 AMAP mercury assessment uh, that shows um, the percentage of re-emission in days after the AMD event. And after three to four days, the majority of studies show around 80% of re-emission. So at that point, it became unclear what really the impact was of these very peculiar Arctic uh, deposition events, whether that was driving the biota levels or whether it's something else. And in 2012, more recently, a very interesting modeling paper came out from Elsie Sunderland's group led by Jim Fisher. Uh, and in, in that modeling study, uh, it was suggested that that Arctic rivers might contribute a, a large amount of mercury to the Arctic Ocean. The way this was done is uh, the left-hand figure here, again, summarizes the seasonality of mercury zero. You see the dip in the springtime, the rebound in summer, and then back to normal. And when they use one of these 3D mercury cycling models that's coupled to, to, to an Arctic Ocean model, they were not able to reproduce that, that summer re-emission, uh, that summer uh, that summer peak in mercury zero. And that's one of the regions, one of the reasons that they suggested that there must be a, a missing source and might that source be uh, be uh, terrestrial rivers, but also coastal erosion. And uh, the, the number that came out of these models over the years has been on the order of uh, 50 megagrams of mercury per year, 50 tons a year. At that time, there was virtually no data on, on the major Arctic rivers, especially in Siberia almost nothing, and uh, a few teams went in. We went in with colleagues here studying uh, the Yenisei River during uh, three years, very high resolution sampling during the flood period, uh, carbon sampling as well. We also looked at, at, at other rivers, and there's been the uh, Arctic Road, the Great River Observatory that worked at lower resolution, but that covered uh, the six largest Arctic rivers in terms of mercury flux. And both studies came out in 2018 and 20 with similar numbers around 40 tons a year. So it's the first time we started to understand the, the quantity of, of mercury coming in with rivers. And that's led to, uh, to um, a big step forward in Arctic mercury budgets. This is a figure from uh, Masha Petrova, a student of Lars Eric Heimberger. And in, the, in this model, uh, there's a couple of things to, to, to notice. So you can see on the left-hand side, here you have the Atlantic currents coming in on the order of uh, 64 tons a year. You have atmospheric deposition, 76 tons a year, and combined erosion and river input also on the order of 76 tons a year. So sort of equally distributed. Um, in, in these mercury models, what in the, in the updated budget and model, what also came out is a noticeable net flux from the ocean to the atmosphere. So you have deposition, but you also have re-emission. And re-emission is larger than, de than deposition. That's, a, that's interesting, right? There's so much mercury coming in from uh, the terrestrial and, and marine currents that you actually have the ocean exhaling to mercury to the atmosphere. And similarly for uh, methylmercury, something interesting to to note. So this is a methylmercury budget on, on the lower right for the Arctic Ocean Basin. The inputs overall are 18 tons a year, but the outputs, especially to the Atlantic Ocean, are 31. So the Arctic Ocean is sort of a bioreactor, producing methylmercury and then exporting it to the, uh, to the Atlantic Ocean. So what happens in the Arctic has an impact uh, for lower latitudes, both through emissions and through uh, export via marine currents. Um, the last quick comment, okay, a lot of terrestrial mercury coming in, but why, why is it so high? What, where does all the river mercury come from? And other studies have started looking at permafrost soils, organic soils, um, and a very interesting study by uh, the USGS, Paul Schuster in 2018 in, uh, in GBC. They, uh, they sampled Alaskan soil pores that are shown in black on the map here, at the right measuring mercury concentrations and carbon concentrations. And you can get a, a mercury to carbon ratio. And then if you know uh, the carbon inventory of soils, then you can extrapolate your carbon 
budget to a mercury budget. And they, based on that uh, Alaskan data and on sort of subarctic literature data, they, they extrapolated uh, for the first time a, uh, an Arctic permafrost soil budget and they found gigantic amounts on the order of 350 gigagrams only in the first 30 centimeters. So about at the same time, we were working in Siberia, where there was no data on, on mercury in soils, working on a transect from the Arctic Ocean all the way down to, uh, to where there's no longer permafrost, 1,700 kilometers, six different soil cores, and we did the same thing, mercury to carbon ratios. And in this figure, you can see a summary of those ratios in uh, the Alaskan soil studied by Schuster et al. Fairly high ratios, 1.6. Uh, microgram of mercury per gram of carbon. And what we find in, in Siberian mineral soils was two and a half times lower. And in peat soils in Siberia, we found 10 times lower. So when we used uh, real Siberian observations to do this permafrost soil budget, we ended up with a far lower number, 72 gigagrams in, in, in the same 30 centimeters. So that's a big, that's a big revision, but that is still a very large amount. And We'll try to put that into perspective by going back to this budget. Um, the Arctic Ocean itself contains 1,900 and 800 inorganic mercury and methyl mercury. It's about 3,000 uh, megagrams. So 72 gigagrams is 72,000 megagrams. And if I put it in a cartoon, this is kind of what it looks like with the boxes scaled to the amount of mercury. So only in 30 centimeters of permafrost, there is a lot of mercury compared to 3,000 megagrams in the total Arctic Ocean, but what really matters is the surface Arctic Ocean, 500 megagrams. And what also matters is the atmosphere, right? Because with Arctic warming, with the thawing of permafrost soil, where is that mercury going to go? It may very well impact the global atmosphere. Um, before we talk more about that, so we know where the river mercury comes from, but where does all the soil mercury come from? Uh, so what's peculiar about uh, tundra soils, organic soils, uh, was studied by, in collaboration with Daniel Obrist in a, a Tulik station uh, where uh, Daniel organized field campaigns where we used uh, uh, gradient uh, approaches, gradient uh, flux towers to measure the, uh, the deposition and emission of mercury from the tundra compartment and we use mercury isotopes to do something very similar between soil and atmosphere. So you, in this figure, you have a two year time series of mercury deposition to the tundra ecosystem. So the green line that you barely see here on top, that's mercury wet deposition by rainfall, which is known to be quite low in the Arctic. Brown line is mercury dry deposition, dust, aerosols that are depositing, fairly low as well. And what was really uh, new in this study is the large mercury zero uptake by both vegetation and by soils. So every, uh, every spring growth season, uh, or basically spring and summertime growth season, you would see this drop in atmospheric mercury and transfer to the soil, to vegetation and then to the soil system. And uh, th this to a large extent explains why Arctic tundra soils contain large mercury. Turns out this happens in, in global soils everywhere. Vegetation takes up mercury along with CO2. And uh, my former postdoc, Martin Giskra, did a very nice study on that. He looked at CO2 and mercury zero time series and came up with this concept of the planned mercury pump. When he looked at forested sites in the Arctic, in Norway or in Germany, you get a co-variation of CO2 and mercury zero. Every summer CO2 drops because of biomass generation, sequestration of carbon, and mercury goes down as well because it's taken up through stomata into the, into the vegetation. If you go to the Southern Hemisphere, and this gets really interesting, Cape Point or Amsterdam Island, no variation, no seasonality at all in, in both signals. And again, we come back to this idea that the Southern Hemisphere is different from the Northern Hemisphere because one is an ocean and the other one has 40% of continental cover. Um, and it's easily to, it's easy to imagine that if vegetation is an important vector of mercury to terrestrial ecosystems, then land use change, deforestation or reforestation are all going to be factors heavily influencing uh, atmospheric mercury levels and in the end exposure, right? So let's go 
back one more time to this. So zero to 30 centimeters, you have 72,000 megagrams. But you can go further. I mean, it's organic soils, 100 centimeters, you're up to 240,000 megagrams. So remember that global anthropogenic emissions are only two, two and a half thousand megagrams. So it, it's only going to take a small change in one of these uh, terrestrial fluxes, either to atmosphere or to the Arctic Ocean, and you're, we're going to have a fairly large problem. But is it really going to happen? Um, the effects we need to, to study and, and, and think of is obviously with permafrost thawing, uh, whether microbial mercury zero is going to uh, be released from soils or from wetlands to the atmosphere, microbes reduce soil mercury to mercury zero. That's a possibility. Um, at the same time, we're going to see enhanced mercury zero deposition by the, by the mercury pump because taiga forests are moving into tundra ecosystems. We need to understand whether soil mercury is exported by rivers to the Arctic Ocean and what then is the fate of mercury in the Arctic Ocean. Is it going to be emitted from the ocean to the atmosphere, which is what models suggest today, or is it actually simply going to be buried on the shelf and it's not going to affect anything? So I'll end it with, with a few um, images illustrating some of these factors. Peat fires have become uh, pervasive throughout Siberia and North America likely emitting a lot of mercury uh, and permafrost thaw slumps uh, are now uh, expanding everywhere in North America and Siberia, uh, discharging mercury to rivers, to floodplains, to the, to the Arctic Ocean shelf, but it's not clear where it all ends up. We've done one study uh, along the same 1700 kilometer Siberian transect where we looked at uh, 30 different rivers. So we go from a gradient where permafrost is absent to isolated, sporadic, to continuous. And we've done seasonal campaigns with the Russian colleagues. So when you go from spring to summer to autumn, what you see is that the sporadic permafrost, that's where you generate most particular mercury runoff. And as the seasons uh, progress, you can see that peak in mercury, it moves into the discontinuous zone in the summer uh, and, in, and in autumn later in the year. So obviously when, uh, when we lose permafrost and we are exposing surface soils rich in mercury to, uh, to runoff, then we can expect to, to, to some extent, enhance river mercury exports. Still, a study like this is not sufficient to, 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 to provide a final answer on that, but it's, uh, it's part, part of the answer. So uh, priorities for monitoring and research definitely uh, for the next decade is to continue the river monitoring because the rivers integrate the entire uh, watersheds. Uh, we need to study the fate of mercury over the Arctic Ocean shelf, understand whether it's emitted or deposited to sediments. We're going to need process studies that Amina illustrated where one by one your, uh, your global change or your climate change factors, you study them trying to understand them. And finally, the, the, the 3D models we talked about, they are well developed for the atmosphere are getting better for the ocean, but they're still lagging behind for the terrestrial environment. And we need to include parameterizations, the math for the plant mercury pump, for permafrost thawing, and for mercury runoff. So that's that's all I wanted to say about the, the, the Arctic. We're uh, welcoming questions again. Hey, thanks very much, Jeroen. That, that was excellent um, and very thought-provoking. Um, there, there is one question in the chat box already, and I think it mostly related to Amina's um, presentation, uh, talking about high methyl mercury concentrations. And, and the, the question was, can the panel please comment about whether the Minamata Convention should be instrument for developing a global standard for weekly consumption of fish by pregnant women? Um, so I. I don't know um, whether that is something that it is being considered, but it certainly seems to me that would be a, a very good idea. Any thoughts, Amina? Um, I would I, I think, I don't know if we should have a global standard. I think that consumption of fish is a really cultural thing. Uh, it's something that uh, different countries and even within each country is people have different fish species that they like to consume, different ways of preparing it, 
And I think that we should be sensitive to those differences and having policies that are cra crafted and designs in a way that actually speak to people's um, cultural way, well-being and needs. And so I think that these should be maybe encouraged at a local level to be discussed and thought about. I don't think that it's a personal opinion. I don't think that we should have a global like mandate or recommendation for people. Osaka, did you want to say something? Yeah, um, thank you. Th thank you. And the, the Minamata, Minamata, Minamata Convention has a, a, a provision on, on health and, and it is uh, uh, it states that the, the, the convention or, or COP will cooperate with WHO and IL on, on, on health related issues. And, and so, uh, as, as you may know, the, the Codex Alimentarius com Committee, which is a joint project and joint, joint activity here of WHO and, and FAO, uh, sets uh, a, a recommended value in the, the daily consumption va va um, limit of, of mercury. But, but uh, if when when and and many countries translate these uh, uh, these these values into the the num uh, the the weight of of tuna or or shellfish uh, of the daily daily consumption, but these are done at national level. So perhaps there there, there may be a room for for WHO and and, and other uh, organizations to 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 support our countries to. To issue such uh, uh, the, the the advisories. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Um, again, I'll jump in while uh, I wait for something in the chat box. So, Jerome, um, are, are there any efforts underway to try and estimate how much uh, mercury is being released from you know permafrost burning? I mean, I've been reading about that in the newspaper recently in Russia that there's, there's massive areas which um has, has anyone tried to get any estimates of the emissions um, yeah i'm trying to think of uh, recent papers on biomass burning and i think there's some projections but uh, you know as long as we don't have sufficient uh mercury data on vegetation and soil throughout siberia uh, such budget estimates will be uh, will be uncertain. Yeah. Um, so we've done one transact in central Siberia, but Siberia is terribly large, and we're trying to move in eastern Siberia, which is geographically very different, much more mineral soil, different mm -hmm. vegetation, more forest. So I think again, data will come out on this over the next ten years to refine such a budget. Uh, obviously, people in the carbon cycling community are ahead of us in terms of that. Right. But they, yeah, they, they already have better inventory. So you, uh, yeah, the carbon emission budget will be known. But uh, if you want to mm -hmm. piggyback uh, your, your mercury budget, we need a little bit more data. And uh, is there is there any um, you know? Um, can you link your your river, uh, you know, inputs, you know, the different rivers that you have been studied? Uh, do they have different, you know, their watersheds? How much of it is permafrost versus other? Can you can you make some links between the river fluxes and the amount of per permafrost and melt, how melting would affect that? Yeah, the different watersheds have, uh, yeah, they have different geology, different. Um different biomes, so they will, uh, at a detailed level, they will behave uh, differently today and they will respond differently to global change in terms of ecological uh, uh, changes. Yeah. yeah. All right, um, I guess we almost out of time. Uh, so um, thanks everyone uh, and I'll hand it back to Osaku. Thank, thank, thank you, Rob. Thank you, uh, Jerry, and thank you, Amina. This, I, I, I believe this, this is one wonderfully interesting session. Uh, before I make my 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 closing remarks, I I, I would invite Joy to uh, to speak on um, from from the ICMGP.
Thank you, uh, Aisaku, and thank you, Jerome, uh, Rob, and Amina for really a very um, thought-provoking and very interesting Mercury session. Um, I think we've learned a lot through it, and I'm sure there's a lot of questions that um, people are still that's still mulling through people's heads, and um, that they will certainly um, probably send to you directly. But I think it's got the creative juices um, uh, flowing, um, and. As I've mentioned at the beginning, it is really um, you as the leads of the synthesis paper on this topic. And so if any one of the uh, participants, if you feel that there's something maybe that was left out or you 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 think, yeah, there's a gap or there's something that you think um, they, Amina and, and Jerome need to be aware of, please do email it to them or email it to myself and and. Saku, we will certainly get that information to you or even to Rob. Um, and then lastly, also just to say thank you very much once again to Isaku and the Minamata Secretariat. Um, there's a lot happening behind the scenes in getting this going. And so um, just thank you very much once again for, for giving us this platform and for Amina and Jerome. Also, um, basically, we, we uh, spoke to them at the beginning of July. And so you really um put your heads together very quickly on this so and it's excellent presentations that you've done so thank you once again for that and um just in final uh next month we will then have um jenny jenny fisher and uh and and uh, larissa schneider um they will then do the uh, plenary uh, uh, talk on the the session will cover basically the southern hemisphere, Mercury in the southern hemisphere, but it, it's it's all on the Minamata online website for season two, which Aisaku them are running. So thank you very much once again, Aisaku, back to you. Thank you, Joey. So um the uh, the only thing I, I would like to say is is, is that that uh, I, I think we I believe that we made a very good start for, of of this um, Minamata online system season two and one quite specific thing about the climate change um i would like to to inform inform the participants that 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 uh the the aminamata convention secretariat and the uh uh stockholm Rot rotterdam convention secretariat did, did, did a study on the chemicals and climate change and also chemicals and bi biodiversity and and the uh we re we recently re released a report of, of a study and the key message of, of the climate study is that uh, of, of course the, the as Ajaran said the, mm -hmm. the 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 mercury cycle is a part of the global, global change so there, there, there's a quite quite a, a cross relationship be, uh, including the thawing of permafrost and secondly uh, the, the, there's a linkage uh, in pol at, at policy level uh, the, the co-benefits and trade-offs between uh, uh, the the countermeasures and also we will uh, we we, sh we should use the common tools such as the inventory and we should uh, make uh, the uh, more more cooperation in in inventory de development and so on and so forth. Uh, in, within the Minamata Online Season Two, we are thinking about a, a session on mercury and climate change, but uh, we are still at that playing playing stage. I I think uh, we 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 will. Uh, Welcome. Any any thoughts on the on the planning? So, having said this, sorry for extending three minutes, but I I, I think it is worth it. Thank you very much, and we look forward to the next session. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, everyone. Be safe. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye.